Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. What a fascinating show today. You're going to want to tune into the entire show because, as you know, from watching the .com Magazine show, we're so interested in high tech. We're so interested in new things. We're so interested in so many different spaces. But one space that caught our attention recently, we were, we were all sitting around watching a, a YouTube video, and we saw a car being manufactured digitally. Part of the components are being manufactured digitally. And we said to ourselves, wow, this space is just getting so incredibly hot. So many people are looking at the space. So we started going through our Rolodex, and we really wanted to bring a worldwide leading expert in direct digital manufacturing on the show. His name, of course, is Mr. Suman Das. And Suman is the founder and CEO of DDM Systems. And of course, they specialize in something that's so intriguing to us, 3D manufacturing. And he's a worldwide leader. You know, if you research him, you go online, you'll see that he speaks at all the events and everybody wants Suman to come on the show. So Suman, welcome to the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you very much, Andy, for having me on. Yeah, it's a real honor to have you. I mean, you're one of the worldwide leading experts. Before we get into it, we're so interested in it. Let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet, Suman. Tell us what you're doing at DDM Systems, and then we're going to get into it. So, Andy, DDM Systems is transforming, disrupting, and modernizing an established industrial process today that is used to make the most high-value parts that you find anywhere from jet engines to land-based power generation gas turbines to the medical implants that you find inside human bodies like the hips, the knees, and the shoulders to a various infrastructure that keeps the world running. For example, anywhere where there are liquids and gases that are being conveyed through long lines, you see components that are made with investment casting. And that is a process that hasn't changed in over 100 years. It's a 6,000-year-old process has not seen any significant innovation in over 100 years. And we are transforming that by cutting out seven out of 12 process steps, replacing them with a single 3D printing step, and yet achieving the same quality metal parts that you see coming out of production foundries today. That's so incredible. I mean, you, you've reduced a number of steps. It makes it more efficient. It makes it more powerful. It makes it faster. 3D printing. I mean, here we are 10, 15 years ago, you never even heard about 3D printing. And here we are with what you're doing with your direct pour process. I mean, that's really incredible. What types of companies reach out to you, Suman, and, say, and they say, hey, we've heard about your manufacturing. You know, we, we've heard about you using the CAD, you know, models, uh, using the 3D, you know, printed ceramic shells. What types of companies are reaching out to you to use your process? Great question, Andy. We, our customers are distributed at, across at least half a dozen vertical industry verticals. Start with aerospace and defense, all the major aerospace, aerospace and defense prime companies, they have need for precision, high quality metal parts where there is no question about the metallurgical quality of the parts and the process that was used to make them where there are mission critical parts. And then we have industrial gas turbines. We have oil and gas, paper and pulp. We have medical implants. We have fluid handling. All these industry sectors, we have companies from all across the world that have approached us. We've conducted projects with all of the major aircraft engine manufacturers and industrial gas turbine manufacturers, because that is where the highest value parts commanding about 45% of the global $20 billion market are made with investment casting. Wow, it's so interesting. Of course, you know, we take a lot for granted, of course, Suman, and we think about steel and aluminum. And, you know, they're so strong. And of course, they're becoming lighter and lighter by the day. But there's so many different types of alloys. I mean, there's stainless steel, you know, wrought iron, tool steel, aluminum, so many different types. 
does your system have the capability to sort of produce any type of alloy capability at all? Where, where, do, where do we stand on that right now? That's an excellent question, Andy. And that is really where the power of using an established industrial process like investment casting, but accelerated by the power and the flexibility and the speed of 3D printing really comes to play. Because if you compare against the emerging metal 3D printing technologies of which I'm one of the original inventors in laser powder bed fusion, the problem is that you have a limited set of qualified alloys that you can make parts for commercially acceptable uh, applications. But on the other hand, investment casting has been around, commercial investment casting has been around for over a hundred years. And there are standard alloy compositions that you can open up a book and say, I want my part to be made in this particular alloy designation. And the beauty is that the same ceramic shell material system can be utilized to produce castings in literally hundreds of standard alloys. So our process and the material that we use, which is primarily silica or silicon dioxide, which is the material that you find on the beach, that's what is utilized to make the shells. And using those, we have covered entire large categories of nickel-based superalloys for jet engine applications, aluminum and steel for various industrial applications. And we've qualified over half a dozen alloys of these types using our shell system to prove that they're equivalent in all respects to commercially produced parts coming out of production foundries today. That's so incredible. Flexibility is tremendous. Yeah, Sorry. it's tremendous. Of course, you know, people call you Dr. Das. I'll call you Dr. Das as well, Suma. So on television, we see sometimes, you know, the jets flying around. And it's incredible to think, you know, that that here we are, 3D printing perhaps has, has produced some of the engines or some of the components for those jet engines. Isn't that right? That's absolutely right. You know, jet engines, especially the ones that fly, the aircraft engines, they represent the epitome of engineering. When you're talking about rotating parts, high-speed rotating machinery, let me just give you a, a small, short little story. Are you going to take a plane anytime soon to fly somewhere? I hope so. Okay. You might be sitting on the exit row seat and you'll be glancing out of the window and looking at that engine hanging off the wing. The thing that you probably don't know, most people don't know, the air that is being sucked in from the front end of the engine from the atmosphere is being compressed to 36 times normal atmospheric pressure. Then it's being mixed with aviation fuel and it's being combusted, it's being lit on fire, which leads to a massive explosion and it's the energy of the explosion that makes the turbines rotate. Those gases of combustion are flowing over the first stage of turbine blades, which are made by investment casting. Those turbine blades have a melting point of about 1300 degrees C. And the operating temperature of the blades is within 100 degrees C of the melting point. And yet millions of people take planes every day and planes don't fall out of the sky like chocolate on a hot summer afternoon. And that's because of the extreme engineering that goes into the materials and the manufacturing technology that is utilized. But the, the, the problem that we face today is that these designs are becoming so complex and so advanced that current manufacturing techniques are not capable of producing these designs in many cases. And in other cases, the lead time to getting the first castings is excessively long. Think about 52 to 80 weeks to get your first set of parts from placement of water. What we're doing, bringing that convenience, the speed and the complex geometry capability of 3D printing, ceramic 3D printing to an established process, we're going to cut that time, lead time to one tenth of its, uh, 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 the one tenth of what it is today. Wow, that's incredible. And of course, that's why so many people are looking at what you're doing, Dr. Das, as being sort of a, a new revolution. And it's really, really powerful what you're doing at DDM Systems. Let's talk about it a little bit because, you know, oftentimes in technology, the defense sort of department leads the way in a lot of different ways. There's probably some things you're working on that you can't even talk about, but Right. Let's talk about some other things. I mean, who? what other types of companies are reaching out to you, Suman, and they're saying, hey, you know, you can produce this, you know, 
this item and this this piece of uh, precision um, instrument that I need at a tenth of the time. Who else is reaching out to you? What types of companies are using your system? It's a great question, Andy. So I'll actually start by saying the original technology development was in fact funded by the U.S. Department of Defense to deal with this extreme supply chain problem with these long lead times that I mentioned. And so they funded the original effort, which was considered a pie in the sky effort. So DARPA, the government's VC came in and funded it to the tune of $6.3 million back in 2008. Since then, we've done progressively, we've done development, but the government actually wanted this technology to be available to both Department of Defense prime contractors, as well as to US industry and to the global industry at large. And the beauty of it is that investment casting addresses more than half a dozen industry verticals. So we've had companies ranging from Nike to SpaceX, extremes. We've had companies wanting to make a mold to uh, to produce a a particular kind of an embossed pattern on the sole of the next generation shoe. And on the other side, we have a company like SpaceX wanting us to make a a very sophisticated part that goes to the bottom of the rocket that shoots the air fuel, um, the the mixture, the the gases to literally cause the combustion and the liftoff of the spacecraft to occur. So in between, we work with companies that deal with um, pumping fluids. So you have all kinds of pumps and impellers which have very complicated internal passages. Another example that we did was think about legacy aircraft that the the U.S. Air Force owns. The supply chain is gone. You need spare parts. There are literally about over 100,000 spare parts that cannot be found today. And they are looking to find uh, companies that can fill that need. And so one example we did for a competition that was hosted by the U.S. Air Force AFWorks, which is literally a It's an analog of uh, uh, running a rapid business competition. There was a part that's on an F-16 aircraft. It's a cover, it's an aluminum cover. It takes over a hundred days to produce from order. And um, the supply chain is disappearing. The foundry, there's only one foundry that can do it. And we did that as a demonstration from the, the, even the drawing, the design of the part doesn't exist. They had to actually 3D scan the part, give us the design. We turned that into a shell. We worked with one of our partner foundries and using that partnership, we were able to go from the the design to a casting in 39 days. So again, that's an example of time compression. So, you know, there's the defense in uh, defense vertical, the aerospace vertical. We are working on uh, parts for industrial gas turbines. These are very large, very high value parts. Uh, which would, like, like I said, take dozens of weeks to make. And we are working on next generation designs for those kinds of parts. We're working with companies in the space segment. We have worked with uh, companies in fluid handling, uh, both US and overseas companies. So wherever there are parts that have internal complexity, complex internal architecture, internal passages, that's where we really bring in that value and speed. Yeah, it's so interesting, of course. I would imagine, you know, it's going to be very, very fun to see, you know, some of the components that you put together, you know, on the moon and on Mars and out in space. I mean, it's so interesting. And, of course, you know, working on these airplane parts with the time compression you've been able to do on the part with the F-16. I mean, they need to produce parts for the older aircraft as well, and that's why they're reaching out to you now. One thing, Dr. Das, that you become worldwide known for as a a worldwide leading expert is you love complex design. I mean, from my perspective, if something comes to you that's easy to do, it doesn't really get you out of bed in the morning, but you love these complex designs. What is it about that that sort of gets you going? Why do you and your team love to do the complex ones, you know, so, so passionately? So really something that really drives us because of what we have developed and what it's really capable of. So just draw a simple analogy. If you use a traditional process, whether it's casting or forging, uh, where you are using a a tool uh, uh, into which you're either pouring molten metal or you're taking metal and you're deforming it to uh, to create the final shape, you're volumetrically creating that entire object at once. 
the complexity that you can then impart to that object is somewhat limited because it's limited by the tools that you use, the dyes, the tools and dyes, and also the actual manufacturing process. But as we are moving forward in the, the past decade and the next decade, companies are working towards new advanced designs, whether in, in terms of getting extreme performance, making uh, parts much more complex internally or light weighting parts, removing material to get light weighting so that you get better fuel economy. All of these uh, requirements are, are needing the creation of new capabilities and new technologies that can achieve those uh, very tight tolerances and extremely fine features easily without significant scrap and significant trial and error and repetitiveness. So what we bring here is we've got a process which is built on very solid fundamental size. There was five years of effort that went into that before we actually went on the, you know, to form the company and, and go to the commercial side. And the key here is being able to really make the impossible possible. I love That's it. Well, nothing is impossible is right behind me. And you're making, you know, you're making everything possible. Of course, when we think about it, and we think about what you're doing. Once something comes out of the casting, you know, we're curious about it. You know, lay, lay people, you know, are curious. How do you make sure that what's produced is absolutely perfect to fit into that jet engine? Is there a, you know, a holographic, you know, holographic sort of system that looks at it from all the different angles? How do you know that it's actually absolutely perfection to be able to go into a jet engine. Precisely. You, you're, very, you're very, very close to how it's actually done. There are many non-destructive inspection techniques that are applied to castings that come out of a casting process. First thing you look for is, are there any surface flaws? So you do what is, what is called FPI, fluorescent penetrant inspection. What you do is you throw in a, like a fluorescent dye, which actually goes in kind of congregates and surface cracks. And then you light it up with ultraviolet light and you, it'll, it'll just show up right like a fingerprint, like how it's done in forensics. So FPI is one area that's done. Then there is 100% X-ray inspection to look at the insides of the part. Did you leave behind any ceramic that shouldn't be there? Or are there any internal flaws? So that is done to look at the inside to do a full 3D non-destructive. So basically what they end up doing in industry is they do a CAT scan of the actual metal parts. And the third thing that is done to look at the complete external geometry and the conformance of the part to the intended geometry, they use something called blue light scanning, which is a form of interferometry. What you end up doing is you project fringes and then you look at how those fringes deform on the shape of, on the surface of the body. And then you do some mathematical calculations to back, take it back and map it back to the original intended 3D design. And this can give you a, a measurement which is accurate to within a third of your or my hair diameter. So that is, that is how close you can match the measured manufactured object to what the designer intended. And in between, there are all kinds of complex corrections and correction factors and all kinds of things that have to be done so that what you desired versus what you make, there's a really close match to it. It's so interesting. You know, we take so many things for granted, Suman. And of course, you know, we go on a plane, you know, you you buy a round trip airfare for 500 or a thousand, you fly business class a couple thousand internationally, you know, it can go from, you know, 500 to 800 to 10, 15, $20,000. But we think about it. So much precision has to go into that plane. You know, we take it for granted that you can jump on a Southwest flight for $199 and get across country, but all the intricate detail in that plane really, you know, it resonates for us when you speak like this because, you know, we don't think about it quite often. Now, let's talk about it a little bit more because you've put together a great team at the company. I mean, you've got some world-class engineers and, you know, uh, manufacturing experts and complex engineering brains there. When you bring somebody on the team at DDM, what do you look for? Are you looking for the background, the experience, the passion, the education level? What are the things that uh, sort of go into your hiring protocol? That's an excellent question, Andy. And it really hits the nail on the head on 
what it takes to put together a tightly integrated team that is going to be highly technically qualified, but also super motivated to work together and to revolutionize the world. So I pay a lot of attention when I bring new engineers into the team. The one thing that I'm very, very thankful for from my PhD days is I was part of a group that developed the laser sintering 3D printing process. And I was in an office with 14 other people that were all from diverse backgrounds. I was a mechanical engineer. There were people from material science. There were people from chemical engineering. There were people from electrical, computer science, metallurgical. So I have followed that template. And that is how I put these teams together because I put cross-functional interdisciplinary teams together, number one. The, the one extremely important aspect that I look for, and I ask this for everybody that I interview, I say, give me at least, I look for at least two strong technical skills, not one. You need to have two strong technical skills, but also have breadth and really need to enjoy doing hands-on work because 80% of the time our engineers are on the shop floor working our printers, developing materials, breaking out uh, shells, breaking out castings and so forth. So people have to have really good training. So the pedigree is super important. And there are a number of schools across the United States where really good hands-on training is given. And I, I'm well, fairly aware of that because of my you know, other job at Georgia Tech. But uh, I look for that and I look for two strong technical skills, but I also look for passion and motivation to really do something groundbreaking. So that's how I put these teams together. And then I intentionally fuse all these different disciplines and they all get to sit together and there's all this cross-pollination going on all the time. Yeah, I love, of course, you mentioned your other job at Georgia Tech. Uh, so you've got a full plate. Now, let's talk about a little bit more. I'm going to hold you a little bit over because I have a few questions. You know, sure. your team of engineers and process designers, you know, they're world-class. When you work with a company like SpaceX, another world-class company, how... How do the engineers sort of collaborate? Is it done through phone, through chat? I mean, how, do your, how does your team and their team communicate in, in such a powerful way? Because both of the groups are very, very specific in what they need and, and they, they will not take anything less than the best. Exactly right. So depending upon what the customer wants to make and the quality and the technical sophistication of what needs to be made, we will, I pull in the right people into the team. Uh, so initial, obviously the initial interface is with me. And then when I understand what the project is about, then I bring in the right people into the team. And then we have a team from their side, our, a team from our side. A lot of the times these interactions happened when COVID was raging. So most of the communications occurred uh, through, you know, Zoom calls and Teams calls uh, and exchange of, uh, you know, secure sensitive files that occurs. And then we go back to the drawing board, we do some work, then we have. So basically when a project gets established and the team from our side and the team from the other side gets established, so for instance, in SpaceX, then we will have weekly cadence calls. We have a weekly catch up call to see what's going on, what progress has been made. Have you guys, the customer come up with any design changes based on feedback that we gave you? And then we'll incorporate that feedback. We'll go into another iteration, make another set of parts, give them the results and say, okay, do you guys like what you see here? Or is there some further changes that need to be made? So we keep doing this iterations until we lock it down. I'll give you the example of SpaceX. We were making these big parts that we've never made such a large size of part. And these are you know, ceramic parts that are going to get utilized in their foundry because they built a foundry on site to make their own parts. Elon Musk got so frustrated. He said, I'm gonna build a foundry on site. So he built a foundry on site. We were so concerned because of the value and the effort that had gone into these parts. Two of my engineers packed the parts, put them in the back of the car and drove them from Atlanta to Los Angeles to deliver them right there and to witness the usage of these parts first time ever. What a great story. And for the entrepreneurs watching the show, that's the level of passion you need to revolutionize the world like Suman's doing with his team. Now, before I let you go, let's talk about entrepreneurship because we have some younger entrepreneurs watching the show may, that maybe can benefit from your background and experience. For the younger entrepreneurs watching the show, Dr. Das, maybe you can give some 
some feedback about what it takes to get through a tough time in business, what it takes to get through a pothole in the road as an entrepreneur and come out, you know, being stronger for going through it? I would say the single most, probably the two most important things, believe in yourself and don't give up. I think those are super, super important because there will be times when you are really down on in the dumps and you are thinking you don't know what to do, you don't know where to go. But what's very interesting, other entrepreneurs have told me this, there will be a time when you're at the edge of the cliff. You will have that moment. But if you get through that moment and you have the power and the conviction and the, the, uh, the, uh, the resolve to get through it, it will be transformational. So I think this is my biggest advice to, to junior, you know, to younger entrepreneurs would be don't give up, believe in yourself and build a great team. And another important piece of advice that I learned long, long time ago, very interesting analogy from the world of tennis. If you want to improve your game, play with people that are far better than you and your game will get better. So look up to people that are super successful who have done technically amazing things and that will push you to, you know, to get better yourself. Such great advice, Suman. I, I'm so excited that you, you mentioned that because we talk about that all the time to surround yourself with people that really, you know, have a different perspective and actually have a knowledge base that's different and maybe even more impactful than your current knowledge base so you can learn from them and, and surround yourself with mentors that really care about you. I know I've taken you over time. I mean, this has been great. I've been waiting to have you on the show I'm going to bring you back here in another six months or so because things are moving so fast with what you're doing. I mean, when you find a company that's really revolutionizing a space, really revolutionizing the world, things move very quickly. So I want to bring you back on in six months so you can tell me more about some of the other exciting things that you're involved with. Uh, such a great interview, uh, Suman and Dr. Das. We call you both, of course. And thanks so much for coming on the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you so much, Andy, for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, most definitely, I look forward to speaking with you again in six months because I think we're going to have some spectacular new advancements that we will be able to share with the world. 